thank you very much, Dave. Uh, thanks everyone for, for coming. Um, this is my updated version of this talk. I've, I've previously given this talk on building APIs using Laravel to uh, a few different user groups before, but it was more of a kind of a walkthrough on explaining the process uh, with some code examples and explaining the kind of the do's and don'ts of building APIs in Laravel. Um, but this time I thought I'd do it a little bit different. So to start with, who am I? Uh, I'm Steve McDougall. You'll find me most places on the internet as just Steve King. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those guys who decided to take his wife's name. So there's always some confusion about who's Steve King and who's Steve McDougall, what's the difference? That is the difference. Um, I am a PHP user group organizer. I started PHP South Wales over two years ago. I've recently handed it over to one of my co-organizers, Oliver Davies, um, let someone else carry the flag for a little while. I'm a conference organizer around South Wales. I'm a huge PHP and Go Lang advocate. Quite clearly, I am a bearded man. And I'm a self-employed consultant where the majority of my work is uh, consulting on API design, API scaling, and uh, basic technical strategy with clients from all over the world. So. A lot of people always ask me, how do people go wrong with APIs? And I think the first thing that people do wrong is they think, OK, so I want an API for my application and I'm just going to create CRUD wrappers, create, create, read, update, delete around every single eloquent model that I've got in my Laravel app. And we're going to prefix all of the URLs of API and make it nice and restish and we'll call it an API. Um, and that's fine for, for some things, but it's not really an API at that point. At that point, it's a, it's a CRUD wrapper with a JSON interface, and it's not providing any benefits. There's no purpose to that API. Um, APIs are really great when there's a really good business use case behind them, and you can design the API around a specific use case, and you can, you can test it out properly. So with Laravel, a lot of us have probably hit that point of no return where we've got uh, hundreds of models in our app directory if you're using anything before Laravel 7. If um, you've migrated from uh, Laravel 6 up to 7 or 8, then that might be in the app models directory. So you, really all you're doing at that point is you're kind of shifting the blame um, into a different namespace sub direct uh, sub name spacing it somewhere under models and you, you end up with this massive tree of models and you don't really know what to do with them but it, it's hit that point where you know if you've got to scroll more than once to find the the right right file you probably need to look at how you're architecting that code in there and as i like to say it's got more scopes than a game of call of duty so you may, may not get that joke but a scope in laravel is just a way to kind of build up a query. It's a way to say where this or where a relationship exists, do this. It's just part of the query builder. So what if there's a better way? And there is. There's a modern workflow to approaching API design and API building now. This image I stole off of Phil Sturgeon. Um, I did ask his permission. And I, when I was coming up with this talk, I was thinking, you know, how could I explain API design and building properly in a nice little flow in a diagram that would explain things visually really easily. And it turns out Phil had already done this and he'd been paid to do it. So I asked if I could borrow it. So what we do, we have an idea for this API. We strategize around it. We, we do that research around, OK, so what is this API going to achieve? What, what is the purpose of us building this API? We gather all the requirements from the stakeholders, whether that be clients, our board of directors, internal department heads, uh, mobile developers. And then we sketch it out. We sketch out all of the different aspects of it and how it should be working with each other. We then go through and use something called Open API, which is a new version of Swagger. And we just create nice API descriptions. We, we iterate through those, we work through those, and then we can create mocks. And with those mocks, we can gather feedback from other stakeholders, whether that's external collaborators, internal developers, your iOS team, your Android team, whoever that might be. And you kind of iterate back through until you've got what's going to resemble the API that you want to build at the end. And at that point, that's when you start building that Laravel code. You start to prototype after that. 
And what it means is that the back end team, the front end team, any mobile teams that you've got, or any of your third party clients that might want to be integrating with your API, they've got an open API description that they can work off, they can mock using different open source tools, and they can kind of build towards what they know they're going to get. Uh, and that's open API, and it is fantastic. So today, I'm not going to do the open API side. A lot of people have done talk, great talks on, on open API. And if I'm honest, I don't think I can add more than what people are already saying. Uh, if you need any examples, uh, Rob Allen, um, so many people are talking about it, you know, drop open API in, into YouTube, you'll have a huge list of talks from various people. Um, but today I'm going to build a nice simple jobs board API from scratch using Laravel. And we're going to concentrate on the Laravel side. So we're going to skip all of the design part. I'm not going to give you a, a lesson on test driven development or anything like that, because this talks all about APIs. So what we're going to build is a nice simple API. And, you know, we're just it's going to build little parts of it and show what, what we can do with Laravel. So on to the live coding. No pressure, Steve, no pressure. So I have already installed uh, Laravel. It's going to be called Jobber. I've got a nice little client over here, which means I can start to build out a new request. And my request can go in there. I am all set to go. My environment is all set up. I'm using Laravel Valet because I am on my new Mac Mini M1. Um, Docker has huge issues with the current MySQL images, so still waiting on that one. So for now, let's carry on with some code. So this is our, de our default Laravel. Uh, I won't go too much into the directory structure, but here is most of our application code. Here's any config that we might need. Uh, all of our database migrations and where we're registering our routes in here. So what I'm going to do to start with is let's open up a browser and let's have a look at what we get straight away. So we should get a nice simple Laravel page. Perfect. So we know our, our application is working, but we don't want this to be a, a web application. We want this to be API only. So what we need to do is we kind of need to say, OK, so we need to approach how we're loading routes a little bit nicer to start with. So we can come down into our route service provider here. And you know we are currently in our boot method. Here is our API routes. And here is our web routes. Well, we don't really want any web routes. Um, I don't really need a prefix either because you know, I'm only going to store an API on this, and we don't really want the namespace to be passed into there because we want to add full IDE completion within the roots file to make it a little bit nicer. Also, I'm not really a fan of this part here where we're just loading in the one file. I like to drop these into version numbers here. So this would be our V1 of our REST API. And what it allows us to do is, is later on, let's say we're going to you know, we're, we're starting to work on V2. Um, we can we can load this in nicely there and it makes it easier. You can manage it in separate files and you don't end up with a roots file that's too long to actually look at. Um, but it also means that if you want to expand this in any way, you could say, okay, so I also want to load in, you know, my GraphQL, um, my, my GraphQL. API and actually, you know, we we actually probably do want to uh, prefix this. So maybe we want to say, okay, so let's prefix a graph GraphQL API, but it's giving us that nice flexibility to do so. Um, and we we're going to version our routes in here, which means that we can come down to our routes. We can create a nice new folder for our API routes. We'll move that in because it's no longer needed. And we can quickly rename, rename this one to V1. Perfect. Drop the comment because we don't need that. And I'm not going to handle adding authentication on this one because I don't feel it's needed right now. Um, so for now, I am just going to, we're going to drop this because we don't need 
this part. So I'm going to do a nice quick route. I'm going to do a nice, a nice simple route on this one. So our, our initial route um, for V1 is going to have a nice function where we are going to pull in that request. And we, all we want to do at this point is we want to return a nice response using the helper and JSON. And what we want to do is, OK, so actually, we don't need that request because we're not going to use anything with it at this point. So let's delete that. And JSON wise, we can just say app. We could just say something like config. Let's get the app name returned. And we'll call it day at that. And we probably want a response code. So we'll use a response. I like to use um, the Symfony response component uh, from the HTTP Foundation. So it allows me to do nice, simple things like HTTP OK there. And there, there's a huge reason for this. Um, when it's simple responses and you're just throwing back a 200 or a 404, we haven't found this, it's fine. And a junior developer picks that up really quickly. But the problem is when you start throwing 401s, 403s, or 318s, or 419s, you know, just, just thinking about them, can you think off the top of your head what they might be? And if a junior developer is coming in and they see, oh, what's this 318 that we're returning, or what's this 419, or what, what's the 418? Um, I'm not a teapot. Uh, it, it means that they can, if they can call the static value through we're constant on that component. We can actually go look. Is it okay? So cool. I can go look at that definition. Uh, okay, great. It's a two hundred. I know what this is doing, and it allows them to be, you know, nice and nice and aware of what's going on, and it allows it to be consistent. Um, perfect. So we've now got a nice little API endpoint here. We could come back to here. We can create a new request. We will just call this um, our root request for now. And what we'll do is URL is there. This should be API v1. And we will add a quick header here. And we want to accept application JSON. Send. Let's put the red goal. Okay, it's complaining about something. Let's check our uh, environment quickly. Okay, I'm going to prefix this, make it a little bit easier. You know, make sure we're coming through. That is what is wrong. I missed a T. Here we go. So I can now come back in and say, okay, let's put our URL in there. I was going to prefix the API. I can now say V1. And now I can send and apparently it's not found. Where are we going to? API v1. Coming down here. This should be service provider API. Uh, this is what I did wrong. I do apologize. We've got to prefix the v1 on this part. Nothing too crazy. We can now come back and we should be able to run this again. But again, it is deciding to fail. Uh, Jobber.test, let's. Oh, wait, we didn't need the V1. That is why. So we've got a 200 OK now. OK, so let me quickly fix that so we can fly through it a little bit easier. There we go. We can fix that quickly. This is the Insomnia API client, by the way. It's it's quite nice for um, if you're a Mac user. Um, I've, I found it you know, quite clean, distraction free, and it's quite quite nice to use, really. Right. What are we hitting there? We are hitting. We don't need that slash there. Now we're getting okay. Cool. We know where we're going. All right. So we know that we're returning a nice uh, route here. So what we're going to build? We're building a a jobs a jobs portal in effect. Um, so what we need to do 
um, let me just grab that chat window and see if anything comes up. There we go. Can everybody see this okay? Is, is, my, uh, is my monitor fine for everybody going forward? Because I can zoom in a bit more. Here we go. Perfect. So the first thing I know I'm going to want to do, I've done a, a, a little bit of brainstorming beforehand. I know from a, a data perspective, I'm going to have a, a job opportunity. Uh, it's going to have a type because it could be a freelance opportunity. It could be contract. It could be a full time position, a part time. Um, and then an opportunity is kind of going to belong to an account because an account needs to post the opportunity. And what I'm also going to do to kind of standardize this is I'm going to have job titles separate. So I've, I've built a lot of these um, recruitment style platforms before in the past, and I've, I've fallen into problems while building them where job titles just started to get crazy and people were spelling, you know, developer wrong. They were, they were rushing through and we just, you know, it, it started to get messy. So having this kind of normalized job titles uh, database table really helps. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to create the titles. So we're going to create a model and it will be job title and we're going to want migration and we will pop a factory and a cedar in there as well. So perfect. So usually what I do at this point, I would be considering uh, my application architecture. So how big is this application going to get? Do I need to approach it in a specific way? Am I going to fall into that issue where I've got you know more, more scopes and more models and I know what to do with them in one specific place? Um, and for this example, it's going to be really light. It's going to be really small. So I'm going to stick to that default Laravel approach. And what I would do as this application grows, I'd start to find where these uh, domain contexts are, where the boundaries are, and they would start to be pulled out into, into their, their context and it would not be keep it nice and clean going forward. There's no point over engineering now when you don't know how big the application is going to be because I've had problems in the past where I've tried to go straight for a uh, domain driven design approach for Laravel early on, over engineered it completely hit a Laravel upgrade and had huge issues trying to upgrade my, my Laravel API because I decided to take a left turn and go off this crazy DDD route when I didn't need to yet. So for this, I'm going to keep it nice, light and simple. We've got our job title here, down in our database migrations here. We've got a nice job title table. And what I'll do is quickly zoom out a tiny bit. So job titles, what are we going to have? I'll keep it light. I won't go too much into the, the specifics of the, the kind of a hiring domain because we'll keep that open to interpretation. So, you know, this it also needs to be unique. So what we'll do, this string will be job titles. Yeah, it's going to be a title. Perfect. That is literally all we need on this. Um, there is a migration done. We can come over to the job title factory, We've got job title class, we can say title, and we can say this Baker title. That's a simple. And then back up on our here, yeah. we can say uh, protected fillable. We have got a title. Ooh, wow, don't know what that spelling is. We have a job title, nice and simple, nothing too too complicated. Uh, that part is done. So if we come down to our cedars, we've got a cedar here. So to start with, I want our job title. We want the factory to create them. And let's say, okay, we want 25 created. Let's quickly make sure that is imported. Perfect. So now we can come to our 
uh, database seeder down here. And what I like to do here is usually what I do is I would keep a if in production run these ones and then exit early. But this is a nice test one, so I can say okay, I would like you to call the job title seeder. So now I can run my migrations. My migrations are done. I can save my database. So now if I come over to SQL Pro, I can see I've got job titles and I've got 25 new job titles that I can start working with while I'm building my API. Perfect. So now I've got job titles, what, what do I want next? Um, let's go for job type. So we want to make similar to that part there, we want to create a job type and we want a migration, a factory, uh, maybe not a factory for this one, I'd probably just say a seeder because there aren't going to be too many different types of jobs. So if we come directly down to migration first, can make sure we fill this out. So our job types, types, um, this will be a string. This isn't going to be something that can be updated. This is more of an internal thing. So I will just keep this to, okay, so the name of the job type, are we keeping, no, that's title. I'll keep it consistent across all of these normalized tables to make it nice and, nice and easy and nice and clean. So uh, our job types here, for this, we're going to want to say, okay, so we're going to have some types. The first one, the title for the first one will be a contract position. We know that we can have contract, contract opportunities. We can have um, freelance opportunities. We can also have um, time opportunities and we'll also add in work experience because that is also quite popular but now what I'm going to want to do is um, so what happens if down the line I want to be able to filter by this realistically I'm going to want to say okay so let's also add in a unique key for this so that I can add it as a filter option in my query and we're going to say slug Great. So that's my migration done. We don't need a factory in our seeder. So we've got all of these here. We could declare these nicely in here. But what I like to do when it comes to this sort of behavior where we're setting things like a UUID or a slug, this is where I like to lean on traits in Laravel because it, a lot of things are going to need yeah, uh, a slug or a UUID. So let's push that off into different sorts of behavior. So for now, I am going to come up, I'm going to come to job type. Um, we don't actually have a factory for this class. So we can drop that first off. And now we can say protected fillable. We want a title, but we also want a slug. What we want, we want this to kind of do this automatically. So in Laravel, they like to call tra uh, traits concerns. So we'll create a nice concerns uh, directory within here, which will allow us to namespace. And we can say, okay, so this has a slug basically. So what we can do, we can start the namespace, app, models, concerns, a trait has a slug and within Laravel if you want a, a trait to boot up when Eloquent kind of starts booting the model itself you can do a nice public static function boot has slug so you're you're basically um, prefixing the, the trait name with boot and what Eloquent will do in the background it will get all of the 
it will use, I think it uses a reflection API where it will just grab any that has got this method and it will just automatically boot them straight away. So what we want to do here, so we are creating, when we're, when we're kind of creating this, um, what we want is, we want to kind of in, intercept this, this model being created, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll stick a default uh, eloquent model in there because this could be generic. We want the model here. So actually we'll, what we'll do, we'll say created because I like to do uh, on the created. So it means that on our job types table, um, this will be nullable, but it will be filled in automatically. So what we can do is you can say, okay, so I believe I should be able to do creating actually. So we want to say the model slug is want the strings, use a string helper, get the slug, import that class quickly, that one there. And we want to basically just say, okay, grab the model title in this instance. And what we'll do, we'll keep that pretty consistent across when, when we're using slugs. We'll always slugify the title for now. Uh, there is another way that you can do this where you kind of pull something off of the model and it's nice and easy and flexible, but for now, nice and clean, let's just do it this way. So let's migrate quickly. Great, our jobs type table is now up there. And um, what I wanna do, I now want to be able to run the seeder. I want the seeder to be ran so that I can see if these will be created. So here's my types here. And I want to quickly run over each of them. So here over each type, and I want to say job type create. You can't do an insert at this point because it's not going to trigger any of the um, eloquent events. So we'll use this, this method here and this in theory. If we just do a new migrate fresh and we'll seed, so migrate fresh will drop all of our database tables, re-migrate them, which means we've got rid of any of the data order there and we'll rerun our seeders. So let's make sure our seeder is in there. It is not yet. So what we can do is, don't need that comment for now. This actually takes an array as well. So what we can do, we can pass that one through and we can say, job type seeder. So let's see if this behaves. Perfect. That is now all up there. So we have now got our job types and they are all in there. That has not added. So let's come back to our job type here. That, is, that has not been told to use it yet. So there is our problem. Has slug. Perfect. So let's rerun that again. That's migrated and seeded all over again. So now we have got our slugs already on in the database for the job types. Perfect. So next, I won't go too much into detail with this part. I'll just start to create the opportunity. We'll skip the account for now. Um, that's kind of not important for this stage. So let's create a nice new model for an opportunity. And what we'll do, we want a migration. Um, and let's say we do want a factory and we do want a seeder for this. Perfect. So I will close all of these down for now, collapse everything, and let's come down to our migration first. So my opportunity, I'm going to want a UUID. You know, I want this to be referenced to a UUID. Could you have used create many instead for types? Possibly. Uh, I'm not too sure if create many will trigger all of the eloquent events um, the way I'd want them to, but it's definitely something I'd, I'd give a go. Um, I can have a go with that in one minute, actually. Um, let's see. If I come back to my job type seeder, if I just say, let's ignore that for now. Let's say it's not showing up. 
Let's, let's try that again. No. Job don't created. Where is that being called? Yeah, apparently there's no create many. Um, it would be nice if there was. But definitely, definitely something I'd have a look at, seeing if I could improve in some way. So I've got a UUID. Um, I know I'm going to want a job title. So let's go. Uh, I know it's going to use a, it's using a big integer or using Laravel. Try big integer. I want the job title. Jesus, I can't time tonight, can I? Job title ID. And let's say, okay, we're, we're going to want to index that because that's going to be important. So we know we're going to um, have have that foreign key there, but we have uh, that index there. So let's say um, we want to foreign job title ID references the ID on job tools. Do, 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 do. Yes, Jaden, it is. Uh, I am using uh, Laravel 8. So, what I'm going to quickly do, I'm just going to quickly drop these down, make them a little bit more readable. So, I know that's going to link to there. What I'm also going to want to do is, I'm also going to want to link to the job type ID. And I'm a little bit picky. I like these to be alphabet um, done in size, not alphabetically, so they, they kind of look nicer to my eye. Um, I just it gives me a nice visual flow that I, I seem to care about. And so what we'll do, we'll do job types in there and we'll say job if I do there. And what we'll do is we can migrate fresh and seed. Perfect, that's gonna work. And what I'll do very simply is I'll do a um, I'll do a nice medium text that is nullable because it might want to be filled in later. And then we'll just say that's called the description. And we'll also throw in a nice Boolean, which has a default of true. And this is going to be whether or not this opportunity has yet to be published. Um, ideally, what I'd usually do is add some sort of salary range in there or saying how much for you get paid and the frequency of it and allow it to be shown. But for the, for the use of time, I'll keep this simple and just keep that part out. So I've got UUID description published and I've got a couple of relationships there. So what I'm going to do is I am going to come over to, um, did I create a factory? I did create a factory. So opportunity, what I want here, I have got a UUID. I'm going to want the, this maker to give me a UUID back. The description, I am going to want to say, okay, so let's also use Faker again and let's get Paragraphs. I'm going to say I want four paragraphs and I do want them as text. Um, published. Okay, so published. What do I want for published? Um, let's just let's have a, a, a random Boolean from Faker um, and let it decide that itself. Uh, then we'll say, okay, so the job title ID is, okay, so let's go job title. Let's just get one from the factory, nice and simple. Uh, and then the job type ID, we will also want that to be, um, we're, we're kind of, we haven't really got a factory. So what I'd say um, in, in run in order, let's just grab a random one and let's just grab the first one, grab the ID just to build this up nicely for while we're doing local development. That has all been pulled in. 
So what it's allowing us to do there is we're adding the UID, the description, we're going to say whether it's published or not, and linking to um, both the job types and the job titles themselves. So that's all of that. That looks like it's all going to work nicely. Um, so now we can come down to the opportunity seeder. And let's just say we want to um, get an opportunity, use a factory to create some. And let's say we're just going to create 150. Um, hopefully that shouldn't kill any. Uh, that's going to be called beforehand. So what I might do, instead of keep keep creating job titles, I'll allow it to pick from the bunch that are already there, because I don't need lots of different ones while I'm kind of testing this out for now. So we'll just say in random order, and we can now come back to our model, to our opportunity. Yes, we've got a factory. So now we can say protected Fillable. I'm much more of a fan of fillable over um, leaving everything unguarded. I like though, those layers of protection with the HTTP validation and then the model validation so that you can't add, you can't do any mass assignment. And then it's the database layer. So you've got nice levels stopping you from making, you know, potentially silly mistakes down the line. Um, so we're going to want a description. We are going to want a um, published. And I'm quite a fan of adding um, the these in here because occasionally I manually add them uh, instead of the job title ID, instead of uh, just doing it through the relationships all the time. It depends on how I'm accessing this. We also say job type ID. But what we also need to do now is we need to cast because we never published as a Boolean. What we can do is we can say that you know, when, when you're casting uh, the publish attribute anywhere, I'd like to be, it to be published as a Boolean. Let's make sure we spell that right. Um, and ideally, what I'd do further down the line, I'd build up my own custom cast for description, because what I'd like to do is kind of keep this in Markdown, because it's a jobs board and I'm a techie, I'd want to be adding Markdown to give some nice creative freedom to help me write my job descriptions. But I'm going to have job title and uh, job type next, so let's jump into the relationships. We can have, uh, not protected, we can have a nice public function. Um, title. This is going to have a belongs to relationship. And what we're going to do, we're going to return this belongs to. I like to be very declarative in, in how I use Laravel. So I will say I want the job title class. and I want it to use this specific field. Here's my local, the, the local, local key here. So if this was, uh, if I'd named this job title, I wouldn't have to add that second argument to the belongs to method there. Um, but I do like to, it, it, it makes it look nice. And I know that it's, it's saying this is this specific column in the database. And to anybody who might be slightly newer to Laravel, it's a little bit nicer. So what I always do at this point, I go, okay, so, I've added this specific relationship here. So let's just add the inverse straight away so that I don't forget and I don't get any issues down the line. So I know I'm going to have many opportunities. So that means I can say return this has many opportunity class. And that is going to be linked to the Job title ID there. Nice and simple. So can I migrate fresh and seed? Jobs type, we just now need to come back through and say opportunity seeder is there. Let's just add it at the end here. Opportunity seeder. Let's rerun that. Let's see if we get any issues. No, we don't. 
So if we come back to look at our database, now we have got opportunities. They are either published or not published. They're linking to specific job types and they've got a nice job title uh, coming from Faker currently. So some of them might seem like odd job titles, but that's fine. It's all we need for now. So we've got to this point um, and we've got our models. We kind of need another one in here. So we, you know, anything that's got a UUID, we're going to want to also add this trait. So we'll quickly add the namespace, uh, models concerns, and we're going to create a new trait called has UUID. And it's going to be very similar to this. So what I'll do, I'll just grab this here, copy this across, and this is going to be has a UUID. Um, when we're creating a model, what we want to do is the UUID, we want to set that to a UUID. I am quite a fan of Ramsey's package personally. I, wanted, I like the UUID4, and then I just say to string. And it means that any time that I create a model, I don't have to worry about um, manually creating a UUID. I don't have to pull in Ramsey's package here, there, and everywhere. Let's pull it in where I need it in this nice reactive part of Eloquent. So in my opportunity here, I can now just say, okay, so, you know, I also have a UUID. So let's run that again. We're failing somewhere. Duplicate job titles. Okay, so we're getting duplication issues on the cedars. That is something I'd usually fix later on. Um, I wouldn't usually create 150 of them, to be honest. So I wouldn't worry about that error just yet. Let's close that down. So we've got opportunities and we've got things going on in our application now. So if I come back to my browser, um, what I like to use is um, th this guy here, um, Tim McDonald. He, he, he did a really nice blog post a few years ago about how we can clean up our eloquent models. And the idea is we're, we're adding our own uh, eloquent builder at this point. We're extending it by using this method here. So if we have a look at this, what we're doing by default in an eloquent model, when we're starting a query, we're creating a new eloquent builder passing through the query and we're going to return a new builder with that query, which will allow us to then um, chain on things like your where clause, order by any sorts, any, any sort of queries that you might want to do. So what I'll do is this is our default here. Let's have a look at implementing that on opportunity first. So let's come down to models, opportunity, and I always do the, I always do uh, relationships first, and then I come on to all of the, the custom bits uh, at this point. So let's say public function, new eloquent builder. Cool. So I want to return a new, this is going to be an opportunity builder because I want a custom one. I won't pull in now, but that's fine. I can still pass through this query. And what I would do, um, now I know I am going to be returning this. So up here in my models namespace, this is where I start to create my builders. And this is what I was talking about with uh, more scopes than your ga average game of Call of Duty. This is where we start to put our scopes. Instead of putting them all in our eloquent model, it means that we can start to add them all into here. So we can say namespace app models builders. So class opportunity builder, and we're extending the eloquent builder, which is that one. So perfect. All of all of my opportunities can be pulled from there. Anytime I'm starting to query anything specifically to do with my opportunities, I can go in there. And because I'm extending the the default builder class, it means I've already got all of the where's and all of the other things in there as well. So I won't fill that in right now. Um, what I'll do, I will share a link to this blog post afterwards because I realize I've already been going for 40 minutes and we will quickly jump onto some API endpoints. So my first thing, okay, so I want to get all opportunities. There's many ways that you can register routes in, in Laravel. Um, and this is how I like to do it. I like to say, okay, so here's my op or 
question it is i probably spelled that wrong um what i like to do i like to say okay so let's create a nice prefix here let's create all of our opportunities um i want to name them as opportunities Like that and then I can group them. And this is where I might add middleware if I want any specific middleware. Maybe I want to check for authentication at this point, or maybe I want to start checking for certain headers, or yeah, you know, I can add any middle that I might that I might want here. So the first thing I'm going to do, okay, so I'm going to want to get all opportunities at this point. So I know that it's going to need a name. I usually call this index. But we're going to need a class here. So, what we're we going to call it? How's our naming convention going to go? So, this is where we need to create a controller. So, let's go to make a controller. This is automatically going to go to app HTTP controllers. What I'll do here, I will probably say, okay, so in API under v1, um, the opportunity, I'm going to create an index controller and I want this to be invocable. This is some of that Laravel magic you've probably heard of. It's a nice little artisan command which will create this controller for me and it will do it in the way that I want it. And the version one namespace. This is a nice little tip I actually learned from Stuart Herbert. He gave a really great talk on managing versioning through namespacing and ever since then it's really stuck with me and it's been super helpful in helping me manage to to scale api scale applications and it's one of the best things that i've used so far if i'm completely honest so we've got our controller here now we have got this part down here so all we need to do is say index controller that one what we're going to do is we're going to expand that class because I don't really want to be pulling a million of them in there. What I'll do, I will just drop these down a level so we can see it nicely. So we're going to app HTTP controllers API v1 opportunity index controller. So this is under API v1 opportunities. So let's go back to our insomnia client here. So under V1, can I go to, what happens if I do this? I'm getting a 200 response, perfect. So if I come back to my controller here, if I just return a nice simple response, yeah, um, we'll return a nice JSON response. And what we'll do, we'll do a ping, just to make sure it's working. We are getting a nice little response back. Perfect. So we know we're in the right place. We know this is loading. So we know we're going to want to start to, we're pulling in that request and we're going to want to work with that request. There's a fantastic package I use for this by uh, Sparsy. And it's a um, Sparsy Laravel query builder. And what it does, it kind of gives you a way to build up um, JSON and API specified specific um, queries and it allows you to build them up really nicely so you can pull in uh, filters and includes and sorts and all of these things and in a really nice easy easy to use way and i've tried building this before myself um i managed to get it working but it was it was a lot more hassle than what it was worth when somebody's already built a package for us to use so i'll quickly pull that in and we'll go through using that so Let's have a quick look at this. So what we're going to want to do, we're going to want a query builder. We're going to want to allow includes, allow sorts, um, and maybe allow filters. So what I'll do, we'll take this as an example for now. We'll say, OK, so um, we know that our, our opportunities is going to be query builder for the Opportunity class. So that's that part there. We know we're getting that. So um, we want to have the allowed includes. What allowed includes do we want? Um, you know, what relationships are on this? We want the, the job titles. Uh, and we're also going to want the job type as well. 
and we're okay so what filters uh, are we going to want on this let's come back to the dogs quickly so allowed filters apparently so allowed filters we are going to want to allow filtering on um with the creator that you know when when was this job created um maybe you want to filter alphabetically on the title the job title itself and is there anything else that we might want to do from this this package right now for a quick example um not not just yet so okay let's also include the type as well just because what i'll do I'll, I'll drop this down because it looks a little bit nicer and what we'll do we will paginate at that point and what we'll do here instead of returning a ping we will just return opportunities come back to our symphony response it should be okay perfect so drop that down Drop this down and drop that down. So if I now come back to my client here, opportunity builder not found. Where is that coming from? Do, 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 opportunity builder not found in builders. Opportunity line 38. Okay, so let's just go have a look at that error quickly. Line 38. New. Community builder. Let's do a quick over dump auto load and let's just redo that just in case. It is complaining for some reason. Perhaps it is part of the naming opportunity builder app models builders. What I'll do because that's not important for this part, I will just comment that out because that's just a nice to have uh, for Laravel. And we will just send that back so we can get on with our API. So here, here we go. We're getting a nice paginated version back. Uh, we're getting all of our, our links back, telling us how many pages we can go through. And we're getting pretty much just uh, a dump out of what, of what we had in the database, which is fine, but it's not an API. So let's quickly change this up so that I don't take too much of your time. So we want to make a resource at this point, and we want to create an, an opportunity resource here. Let's create this resource. Got a resource down here, and there's many ways you can do this. Um, you can do it nice and simply, or you can do it in a bit more of a JSON API standard way. So what I like to do, I like to say, okay, so I want to identify everything to the UID ideally. So let's just say this UID. Um, what type is it? Okay, so this is an, an opportunity. And what attributes are we gonna have? So we're gonna have um, description. And we'll just keep this simple to description and published. And then we will also want to include relationships. Let's drop this into an array. And okay, so we know we have got a um, job title. We, we'll pop this in here. So what, what we can do at this point is we can kind of eager load this when it's required. So we can say, um, we can return a new job title resource. What I'll do, I will copy that. And I will quickly make one of those. And we will say this when loaded, when we are loading in the title. That again, we can do the same with type. 
new job type resource this when loaded like let's grab that let's do the same thing there so what we're doing here is that doesn't need importing so what we'll do is we'll grab this here and we'll come over to job type resource grab that and let's say uh, it's a job type this is going to be an id and this will be title here what we can do now we can grab that um, we could probably actually include the slug with this specific one and in the job title we'll just grab this and we'll just return the same sort of thing and this is a title there so what we can do now we can come back to our opportunity resource there come back to our controller and instead of returning this part here we can return a opportunity resource instead so we can say okay opportunity resource we want a collection of these opportunities done come back to here run this again with an id type attributes description and whether it's been published and we're currently not loading in any relationships so what we can do we can say actually we want to include the title we could start to pull in that job title there add a comma and we can say okay we also actually want to include the type so we're pulling in that job type too Ooh, type on opportunity was not defined opportunity we did not define the job type public function type belongs to can be very similar to the above Job type ID. That should now work fine. So we've got title, we've got type, we can pull that through, we know what types are, and we know where everything is. And that was, you know, fast and furious how we're going to load this in. So what this is allowing us to do, if we go back to that package, is it means we can start to do things like filter where a name is something specific. So if we come back to our database, um, we know that in our filters on our controller here, we're allowing the type filter by type slug. So let's come back to here. Let's come over to job types. And let's say, let's just grab freelance. Let's say um, we want to get all freelance opportunities. This should allow us to now say um, and filter um, type slug equals Perfect. This will give us all freelance opportunities now. And we can also, okay, also say, okay, so we want any, um, we want all work experience. Perfect. We can, we can limit that down really nicely. And it's, you know, this package just gives us that, that flexibility here. And we can also start to sort it. We can say, okay, so um, loud sorts we want to allow sort on um created that uh, i'm going to drop this created that from the filters because i won't really want to filter through a date stamp but we'll probably want to sort by created that and um we will say okay and sort equals created at perfect so at the minute we've got this particular one, we're a court clerk first. So if we now just spin that around, it's giving us the same thing. Let's go double check that package. So where we get down to sorts, oh, allowed sorts, did I spell that right? Yep. Do, 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 allowed sorts. 
that should in theory be be working. Um, you can also include specific fields. Okay, that doesn't seem to want to behave, but no problems right now. Um, the basic principle is there. So what it's allowing us to do is to get all opportunities, including some relationships, filtering by a specific type, and we can start to sort in specific directions. And it keeps it nice and clean, nice and simple. It's one route and it's powerful already. You know, when you could look at GraphQL and you could build up this, you know, this complicated part in the back where you've got to map all your mutations and map all your different types that you can push through something like Lighthouse, or you could build for something like a JSON API compliant REST API, which will allow, us, allow you to do something like this. So instead of these complicated queries that, and different kind of query language your developers will have to learn, you can just follow REST and follow REST a little bit more carefully following a standard like JSON API. And suddenly you're getting almost the same amount of power because we can filter what, what fields we want back. We can filter aspects of, of our query in one string, nice and easy. And when you're building that front end UI, you can have triggers which will build up this query for you, nice and simply. So that is building a Laravel API really quickly. It's not a big API. It's not doing a lot at this point, but we've got some we've got some uh, eloquent models going on. We're, we're defining our relationships. Uh, somebody said that the namespace may have been wrong on on that model builder here. So app models, you, you are absolutely correct. Um, the namespace here is correct. I like it to be called builders um, because that's what's in there, builders. Um, so if I do a nice composer, do you, is that gonna complain? No, that did not complain that time. So that means I should be able to come down here and we can say, uncomment that out. If we come back to this, we should no longer get the error. Perfect. What it allows us to do if we come back and have a look at how this works is um, all we need, instead of adding scope prefixes, we come down and we say, okay, let's move all of these scopes over somewhere else and remove a scope prefix and return this. So all we're really doing is uh, moving how we're querying to a different class. So in this opportunity builder here, we can say public function, we only want published. This is gonna return, um, it's gonna return an instance of itself back. So we can say this, this where published, this is all to do with casting at this point, and then we return this. So what we can now do here, we can actually limit it early on. We can say, actually, we only want those opportunities that have been published. So now we're not gonna get any unpublished opportunities. Perfect. So we can start to have that draft status or a deleted status on our job opportunities, and we can keep them automatically out of the API. And what we can do, we can add maybe an override in here to, to add that to the query and it keeps it nice and clean. And that is the probably as much time as I've got for walking through the API. So I'll just finish off my slides. I have been working with Phil Sturgeon, um, learning APIs from him for a long time. And this book, Build APIs You Won't Hate, is what I refer to as my Bible. It is what I learned APIs from back in the day. It is what I, I've got a copy on my bookshelf. And it's something I always thumb through when I want a little bit of nostalgia and a little bit of reading. Um, and Phil has kindly sent me, or is sending me, the last 12 copies that he has got left. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna raffle them off through his charity. And all of the proceeds are gonna go to help planting trees. Um, if you'd like to, to get involved, if you'd like to inquire about buying a raffle ticket, um, reach out to me on Twitter. There's only 12 books available, but what we're trying to do is I just want to, he's got some books. I talk to lots of people. I'm going to try and raffle these books off for him and 
let's see if we can help him plant a few more trees and make the world a little bit greener. Um, I like to end all of my talks in a quote. REST APIs don't have to be hard, but they do have to be stateless. This is one of my own quotes because I like to add them to my own talks because they're fun. So I'd like to say thank you for listening. Uh, that's my Twitter handle at the bottom. That's my also my GitHub handle. I've got loads of stuff on GitHub if you want to go thumb through some of my code. If you want to give me any feedback, if you want to call me out on anything over Twitter, please feel free. It's what it's there for. If there's any questions, I will now take them. Beginner question. So I have not used Laravel. I've recently used Slim to build a middleware API. Does Laravel ship with a HTTP client like Guzzle? And how would you create middleware and add it to a root in Laravel? So yes, it's got a it's got Guzzle in, in there already. Um, and it's really easy to access it actually. I'll show you here quickly. Um, it's got a nice little facade. Um, so let's go for that one. And we can say, we just want to get this URL and it allows you to do it that way, nice and cleanly, really simple. Uh, with middleware, um, there's an artisan command where you can say, uh, make middleware, test middleware, that will then create it up in HTTP middleware, um, test middleware here. You add anything within here that you need to do. And then what you can do is, um, if I come to v1.php, you would just add middleware on this part of the loop here. And this accepts an array. So you could, once you've named it and you've added it into your HTTP kernel in this part here, you then add it into this middleware part for either a group of roots or a specific root, and it'll then apply it. And I believe it's the first in last out approach, but I cannot remember off the top of my head. You are most welcome. Happy to answer any questions about this or anything else to do with Laravel APIs in general. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, Steve, thanks for that amazing talk. It was really good. Um, I was keeping up mainly <laughs> um, that the Sparty. Um, module Spassy. like yes. Sparty library that looks really handy actually I'm going, um, i'll drop it in the chat quickly um there you go that that has saved my my bacon so many times trying to build these complicated apis um it's just it, it gives you so much power and you don't have to do much and it's yeah. a very well built library it's well tested and it just works um, what I'll also do for anybody interested, I will grab that uh, eloquent builder link and I'll also pass that in the chat now for anybody who wants to kind of maybe read into that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a question for me. Um, you mentioned earlier on about um, a domain driven design approach and yep. a, a DDD route to, to try to avoid taking that too early. Um, yeah. Could you give an example of a scenario where that might be the case or where you've experienced a, a kind yeah. of that, yeah, definitely. that situation? <laughs> so um, one of the one of the companies that I worked with, uh, we were building a jobs portal. Um, yeah, I've done I, I've lost count of how many years I've worked in kind of building kind of HR style applications. And what we were doing, it was relatively simple to start with. It was, okay, so we want a company to be able to create their jobs on the platform and want people to be able to, be able to apply. At that point, it was relatively simple. And uh, from a kind of a, a quick visual depth perspective, it was it was okay. You, you, know, you could find things easily and you could navigate quickly. But as 
time went on and as the business grew and as we started to do more things with the application, we started to add in applicant tracking. We started to add in uh, real-time uh, video interviewing. We started to add in notes on applications, started building, like adding and building a CV on the platform. It started to add all of these extra parts to the application that made finding things that little bit slower. And it, you know, the, the complexity of the application was, was growing. And that's when it made sense to say, okay, we need to start looking at this in a domain driven approach. So what we want to do, we want to have a, a hiring domain. We want to have a, um, well, maybe not hiring, that's a bit too generic. We want to have um, an, app, uh, yeah, an application domain. So people, could go to that domain and in, within that specific domain they could find all of their job applications they could submit job applications they could read applications they've been given and that was the applicant tracking part of it and then they'd have another aspect to it which would be interviewing and that would all be to do with uh, sending out invites and kind of setting up these meetings checking schedules and it, it started to build out like that so we went from what was a relatively simple and quite flat application or even API or application in, in Laravel or in any PHP framework. And we went from, you know, maybe five or six entities, which wasn't too complicated. They started to stack up really quickly. And that at that point, some of the more junior members in the team, it took them longer to find things. And the visual depth, when you opened up your IDE, and you were like, okay, so I need to, I, there's a bug on this model or in this controller, and I had to go find it. That's where they start to struggle, is, is kind of navigating through, um, you've probably seen it in the past where you've got, you know, 50 controllers in, in one folder or 150 in one controller because it started to grow. And then if it's starting to reflect your database and you've got 78 database, uh, tables when you've got 78 eloquent models and trying to filter through them and find them it, it gets very complicated very quickly which is where domain driven design really helps with was well, you can't truly follow it with laravel because of eloquent but you can you can you can kind of uh, fake domain driven design the approach so that you can logically group your code yeah I see. And with that, when you start doing that, it, it sounds is that whole essentially wholesale refactoring of the of the code, or is it sort of yeah. moving it and pieces around? I, I I typically move pieces at a time, so I I I concentrate on one domain at a time. And okay, yeah. I'm usually yeah I'm usually a uh, PHP Storm user. I'm on a Mac M1, and at the minute it seems to be eating um, my RAM for some reason. So I'm using VS Code for now. But usually what I do, I take one of my domains and I would just refactor classes using PHP um, Storm's refactor abilities and just, just move the class to a new domain. So it iterates through everywhere, moves it, run my test suite, everything's green, move on to the next class, move that across again, next class, move that across again. It's nice and quick and PHP Storm really, yeah, it makes refactoring things like from a standard MVC to a domain driven design approach, it makes it kind of simple. Okay, uh, there's a question in the chat now. Why would you use this approach over GraphQL? Uh, I suppose that's more of a personal question. Um, you know, I, when GraphQL first came out, I started using it, I learned about it, I tested it in a Laravel application, I tested it in a Slim application. And I, I liked it. You know, it was cool. Um, then HTTP2 came out and suddenly we didn't have, you know, unidirectional streams coming to and from the server. We have the uh, server push. So, you know, that speed factor of, of GraphQL over um, REST was no longer an issue for me. And then um, following proper REST principles and actual REST API design and then uh, proper specification like JSON API, it meant that I didn't have to learn GraphQL. It, didn't, it meant I didn't have to create all of these different 
type implementations or mutations in my PHP code on top of what's already there, I could do that all in query parameters nice and quickly. Um, for me, it was personal preference. There's nothing wrong with GraphQL. You could build some really good APIs with it. And I think these days, if you're building a Laravel API, and if you use something like um, just pull in the Lighthouse PHP library, you know, there's no reason why you can't provide both to, to your clients. You know, have you have an open API spec for your, your REST API, and I believe there's a similar spec available for GraphQL, which you can also provide, and you can maintain them relatively simply. That helps. Thank you very much. Hi, Steve. Can I ask a question there? Um, thanks yeah. for the talk. Um, I just wondered what your um, go-to approach would be for if you needed to um, check the signing of requests. What If there was like a package you use for that, where you just roll, roll your own sort of thing? Uh, what do you mean by the signing of a request? Like... Uh um... Yeah, if like if um if you were having API keys and you didn't you wanted yeah. to ensure the API keys weren't just sent um you know as a, as just basic text, you wanted to kind of hash those bits together and then unhash okay. it at the other end and check it. Um I've never really had to do that if I'm honest. Um if I needed to, I'd probably roll my own because it's it's relatively minimal. Uh in your API documentation, you just need to kind of define how you want to hash that API key um, or how you accept that API key hash and then just make sure you do it on the other side when you're decrypting it in middleware. Um, most of the time with API keys, you, you handle that in middleware. So mm. before you're even trying to think of doing any logic or anything like that, it's okay. So have I got the API key because this is a protected route? Um, if I decrypt it, is it going to match the format I'm expecting? Yep, cool. We can decrypt this. And thirdly, is it an yeah, is it a valid API key at that point? And beyond that, it depends on the API key and the approach. Are you you know, does it have scopes and abilities, or is it a simple kind of lock and key approach? Sure, great, thank you. Brilliant. That's okay. Uh, well, thanks, Steve. Uh, That's okay. I've got I've got a uh, one after the question. Um, how do you go around testing uh, what you've just made? What would you be your thoughts on that? Um, I usually write feature tests in Laravel, and it's got a really, really good built-in um, built tools for that. You can test status codes. You can test JSON responses. You can test um, like if parts of JSON appear within within the response coming back. That's my typical approach is my first, what I typically do is if you don't have a lot of time to test, at least do status code tests. That's my number one advice to anyone building APIs is worst case, make sure you're getting the right status code because there's nothing worse than trying to um, deploy an API, all of your tests passing, but you're getting a 500 error on one endpoint that wasn't caught in any of your other tests because it's, an in, you know, it's part of the uh, implementation. It's not the unit part. It's not the logic. So it's kind of smoke test, kind of. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I'd, I'd love to look at a way to kind of test against open API. So I, you know, there, there's parts where there's some packages out there where you can validate your API against your open API specification, but it would be nice to be able to kind of smoke test it and then validate the response as well. Um, it would be cool if there was a package that would do that. That would probably, that's definitely something that I'd adopt very quickly mm. because if you're using open API, you've probably got third-party vendors using that description to integrate with your API, you got your internal teams, front end, and any anyone else working with that API description. You want to kind of make sure there's consistency within your testing tools. Sure. So, so in, in that particular example, because you had uh, lots of, I suppose, random, I mean, they're not random, but semi-random, I like job job types, for example. You, you yeah. wouldn't be able to. How? Do you, I mean, would you be able to test it? 
because you need to know how they're seeding so you can say i expect a response that yeah has this job title in yeah so typically what i do with with my seeders i have um i use my seeders mostly for um local development and testing up on ci or anything like that and then what i do i, I maybe have a, a separate selection of seeders which i run on production which is in charge of kind of get my application to a base state if I'm deploying it for the first time. And that's usually bringing in all, any sort of normalized tables or any meta tables that I might want to get up to date. But the, the seeders, I mean, for, for test, if you wanted to go further than your smoke test and say, I expect, you know, the first response I get back has this particular job title. Uh, maybe I'm missing, um, in, the, in the seeders, did it just generate random job titles? I mean, they sounded like yeah. job titles, but does it always generate the same job titles? Or? No, uh, it, it uses Faker underneath, so it'll be random each time. So it will just give you a random job title through that seeder. I say I want 150 job titles, and it will just give me 150 random job titles straight away. Um, you could build up your own fake data set if you wanted to be more specific. And that's what I did in the job type seeder, where I said, OK, so I know for a fact that these are the job types I'm going to be using. I want to add those in and I can test against those responses really simply. Um, if you wanted to be more controlling in how you're testing, then you could quite easily do the same thing. Uh, so actually on a similar vein, uh, something's just popped up in the Q&A uh, from an anonymous, anonymous, but I don't know who it was. Uh, but they ask, uh, do you validate that the response you're sending back validates against the response in the OpenAI spec before sending it, uh, in a similar way, you would validate the request before doing anything else with it. Uh, I haven't yet uh, in Laravel, if I'm honest. I've yet to find um, a good way, a good workflow for that in Laravel and OpenAPI. If I'm 100% honest, um, I know there's some packages starting to emerge, and there's some people doing it certain ways. I just haven't found my way yet. Um, if they, if anyone's got any examples, I'd love to to see one, and I'd love to start yeah adopting that open API validation within my application. Um, that would be great. Cool, thank you. Are there any more questions? Oh, we've had a few more things pop up in the chat. Okay. How do I cache requests? That is a big question. <laughs> Everyone's got their own kind of caching strategy usually. Um, and when you're using kind of this JSON API standard, it's quite hard to properly cache that request, uh, cache that possible uh, response back because you know all of the, your, your cache is gonna get absolutely massive um, to be, it depends how in depth my API is, depends on how I cache. Um, the more in depth my API, the longer it's going to take me and the more I know I'm going to have to spend on, on the budget for the cache itself. If it's a simple API where it's got maybe one or two option, optional parameters coming through that, um, that query parameter, then, you know, I could just you know, chuck those into Redis. There's some great packages out there actually for response caching. Um, I yeah, I'd probably do something like that for on the simple end. And the more complicated it gets, you know, it's how long is a piece of string when it comes to caching and JSON API. And is it simple like HTTP client requests? I don't know. I don't get quite what you mean about that second question. So I'll move on to Nelly quick. Uh, what was your recommended development environment for Laravel API? I'm currently using uh, Laravel Valet myself. Um, I'm usually a Docker fan, but I'm on an M1 Mac, so I'm not able to um, use uh, my SQL images at the moment. Um, I've got local databases, so I suppose I could do that, but Docker's can be hit and miss on the M1 currently, so I'm waiting until that's stable before fully adopting that. 
um, apologies if it was covered in the talk, is it better to have multiple smaller requests to separate API endpoints or more information bundled into resources? It de really depends on what your API is meant to be. It depend, you know, to me, an API needs to have a use case. Um, and you expand that the more use cases you get. So what you start with, with you know, maybe five to six endpoints, quite, you know, quite small or quite large responses coming back, that slowly migrates over where you start to add more business use cases where you need another API for this type of business interaction, because maybe you didn't think about uh, persona when you were starting to do the API design side of things. Um, so I think the best answer to that would be to have something like JSON API where you can kind of define the size of the response coming back based on how much you're asking for. I, I feel that's the, you know, the best middle ground without diving into um, any sort of strategy for, for your API. You're welcome. I think uh, one more, your raffle, where are you going to plug that once that's all good to go? Where's the best place to keep an eye for that? I'm going to do that on Twitter. Um, what I'll do is, um, don't, don't worry about following me. I'll probably come up with a hashtag of some description. Um, that's, I, I only yeah. discussed this with Phil today, to be honest. Uh, okay. um, we'll, we'll keep an eye out and we'll share some details yeah. as well around. Yes. Yeah. Basically, he sent me 12 books yesterday. I think some of them might be signed, um, which would be, you know, if, if you're into APIs and you like Phil, it's a cool little thing to have. Um, but yeah, keep keep your eye on Twitter and either myself or hopefully uh, PHP Southwest will, will retweet that so you can see that. If there's no more uh, questions. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, very much appreciated. Thank you everyone for coming along.